Welcome to the Catalyst Podcast. I'm your host, Sondang Sirait, Communications Advisor with Catalyst. Catalyst is a unique five-year government-backed business development program that unlocks the vast potential of economic partnerships between Australia and Indonesia. More than ever, technology is redefining the way we live, work, and play. In Indonesia, massive developments in connectivity along with technologies related to machine learning, artificial intelligence, and automation are driving what's being dubbed the digital revolution. This year, as Indonesia takes the lead of the G20, digital transformation is rightly high on the agenda. In this episode of the Catalyst podcast... We'll explore what it takes to emerge a winner in the digital age and how Indonesia and Australia can work together towards that end. Thank you for joining us. We invite you to join in the conversation on our social media and website at ayachepa-catalyst.org. Indonesia juga memberikan perhatian serius pada pengembangan teknologi digital, terutama yang mempunyai kontribusi langsung kepada pemberdayaan UMKM dan pengembangan SDM. Kami ingin mengundang investasi yang memberikan kesempatan kepada seluruh lapisan masyarakat untuk berpartisipasi dan mendapatkan manfaat dari transformasi ekonomi digital ini. Untuk mendorong interkonektivitas global yang semakin meningkat, saat ini ada tiga investasi pembangunan kabel telekomunikasi bawah laut yang sedang berproses yang menghubungkan Indonesia langsung dengan pantai barat Amerika Serikat tanpa ada negara perantara. Indonesia juga akan memainkan peran penting dalam ekosistem semikonduktor. Dalam tahun ini kita akan membangun fasilitas chip design dan pabrik polisilikon di Jawa Tengah dengan kapasitas 40.000 ton. Back in late January when kicking off the B20 inception meeting, President Joko Widodo shared his thoughts on Indonesia's ongoing digital transformation. He talked about increasing global interconnectivity through investments in submarine cables connecting the country with the United States. He also talked about developing a homegrown semiconductor industry, which would include establishing a chip design facility and a polysilicon factory in central Java. But above all, he called for investments that would empower small and medium enterprises, upskill workers, and at the same time, support digital inclusivity. While it is true that emerging technologies pose many opportunities for improving people's lives and generating economic values, it is important to note that technology disruption has never been neutral. It creates winners and losers. On this note, we must be cautious of the challenges that could rise from a digital paradox, especially in some parts of the world where digital divide remains existing. The government of Indonesia believes that digital transformation must be inclusive and empowering. That was Mira Taiba, Secretary General of the Indonesian Ministry of Communications and Information and Chair of the G20 Digital Economy Working Group. Disruption of digital technology, she warns, inevitably exposes the digital divide especially in terms of connectivity access, people's digital skills and literacy, as well as cross-border data utilization. Well, any talk about digital economy brings to mind the core elements that come with it. Connectivity, digital literacy, and data flow. Let's now bring in Caroline Gondo Kusumo, founder and CEO of Dutakom Wibawa Putra, a leading Indonesian internet service and information technology provider based in Surabaya. She is also the Secretary General of the Indonesia Australia Business Council, East Java Chapter. 
Ibu Caroline, thank you for joining us on the Catalyst podcast. Good morning, Bu Sonda. I'm glad to join the podcast as well. Thanks for the invitation. Speaking of digital transformation, in your line of work as CEO of a leading company in the IT sector, where are we now on this path towards that goal? Right now, we are actually in the interesting period. We are experiencing acceleration due to this current pandemic, as we know. And I think there are actually no limits for digital transformation. So I would say, yes, we are on the path for digital transformation, but the path is quite dynamic. One indicator that Indonesia is already well on the path is that we already accounted for nearly half of Southeast Asia e-commerce market. That's according to the Techno Business 2021. And in Indonesia itself, we are now focusing in several key priorities such as digital for economic health, national resiliency, digital infrastructure, digital entrepreneurship, and also ensuring the safety in digital spaces. Digital transformation is certainly changing uh, the way we do business from automation, big data, to artificial intelligence, robotics. You are based in Surabaya, the, a city that we know is the beacon of manufacturing in Indonesia. How ready is the industry in East Java to embrace digital transformation? Well, as you mentioned that we are a manufacturing-based region, we are embracing technology step by step. More and more Surabaya companies has been moving to automation and robotics, and they have applied that, and some has started catching up on big data and artificial intelligence. In the late 90s, people starting to utilize, they start to understand the internet for their new way and communication and doing business. What's happening now is Indonesia younger generation are far more tech savvy. And therefore, they are the driver for the latest technology changes, such the trends such as the AI, big data, blockchains. Data and digital technology previously was for efficiency and cost cutting on the for the operation, but that fact is has changed. Today, uh, they are the driver of innovation and revenue growth. They are the key for entrepreneurs to unprecedented opportunities and reshaping their business. So I would say that this uh, younger generation is the one that will implement the next step for this digital, digital transformation as the key driver for economic development. They are not only on the startup, but also will be implemented on the tradi- traditional manufacturing industry. To help this younger generation of entrepreneurs that you mentioned, we need to accelerate the development of the ecosystem the digital ecosystem, including uh, preparing high-speed internet infrastructure, something that you are working on. How is the private sector working with the government to ensure that that goal is met across Indonesia? And are there challenges that we should watch out for? The private sectors actually um, has been working with the government in so many ways. We have uh, programs that, um, for example, one of the the program is like the telco providers are setting aside, I think it's one uh, quarter percent from their revenue to provide fund to connect this remote area and villages. And government is leading this connectivity program with VSAT, fibers, and other um, connection. And therefore, the private and government are actually hand in hand to solve these challenges. For example, my company uh, last year has been involved in government program to provide this connection to West Nusa Tenggara and also the East Nusa Tenggara and some part of Papua. And also through the program, my company Dinet has set up internet access in the rural area in Romo at that time and witnessed firsthand how connectivity actually helped them to grow, uh, develop the, the region. So one of the examples how we actually private sector working with the government Part of the, the challenge of this connectivity, e-commerce is growing so big in Indonesia right now, right? The challenge would be to watch out actually the logistic issue that will be faced by Indonesia because Indonesia is like archipelago. Demographic is like huge and quiet. Um, the topology also is another challenge. So 
part of the connectivity, the logistic will be the challenge is how to get the products to the customer, especially in the island or in the remote area in a timely manner. President Jokowi has often called for companies to upskill and reskill their employees with the appropriate uh, skills and knowledge to prepare for this new digital age. What skill sets do you see are currently most in demand? Right. The skill set that will be that currently is um, in demand is programming will always be in high demand to the application and artificial intelligence. What is in high demand is also the big data expert, the data analyst. Another one that's also in high demand, actually the network and information security. As you know, that there's a lot of um, hacker, the breach of the data, privacy issue as well. So they are uh, very much needed. Another things that's also needed is, I think the multi-platform user experience um, design. That's uh, with the growing of the number of platform programmer for the UI designer, we'll have to ensure to capture our attention, the audience attention, because um, there's so many options and will be more. So it's how we actually develop our website application, um, digital uh, media to capture the, the, uh, the audience um, attention. Another thing that's interesting actually, in the future, everything will be very much um, automated using the robotics. What's needed actually is the creative thinking, that's things that cannot be done by the robotics. So that's other, the, the soft skill that we can have. Also, if you look at the pandemic and what it has amplified is a series of challenges, but also opportunities for online education delivery technologies. This is an area in which Australia is keen to work with Indonesia. What potential do you see in this area? And is there interest in the private sector in Indonesia? There is actually a huge opportunity. As you can see now, like how many private schools and universities or courses in Indonesia, we have like 3,000, more than 3,000 universities and 122 state-owned um, university. I please is only small percentage that has developed proper online learning platform. According to study by UNICEF, more than half of the people is not aware of the rumah belajar and they are not using that platform. But most actually still using this um, social media for their teaching um, media, such as the Facebook, WhatsApp, Google Meet, or Zoom. They are the most popular because they are more affordable and also doesn't need um, high internet connection. So my suggestion uh, for the probably education technology in Australia that wants to enter the Indonesian market uh, you might need to do a bit of the survey to understand the current market and we need to adjust to the to the situation because for some university in Indonesia um, to build this um, learning platform it would be a new investment which they will think uh, take it slowly rather than aggressively. This is also due to the number of the students that are not ready with uh, their computer, with their gadgets or their internet connectivity. So if you want to start early, just build the things together with uh, this university. So for the Australian company um, who wants to enter this Indonesian market, yeah, you need to have a long game plan and mindset of growing together. Thank you, Ibu Caroline Gondokosumo, for being on the Catalyst podcast. Thank you for the opportunity. And I hope uh, Indonesia and Australia will grow together and prosperity together. Well, Indonesia has the seventh highest internet usage in the world and faces great opportunities as well as significant threats. Indonesia is embracing digital technology and aims to expand its GDP by 10% by 2025. However, without a solid cybersecurity approach, this could easily increase the digital attack surface of the country. But there isn't a single action that will prevent future threats. I believe that encouraging global cyber collaboration is an effective way to share and learn from one another about how about to best implement future defense strategies in conjunction 
promoting industry-based awareness campaigns and a wide array of educational programs that deliver current skills and knowledge is key to training the future employees in this fast-paced industry. That was Michael Jack, Educational Coordinator for Cybersecurity at Box Hill Institute in Melbourne, sharing his expert view on what it takes to strengthen Indonesia's data protection regime in the context of moving forward with digital transformation. At the sectoral level, Indonesia's priority area of digital transformation aligns well with Australian expertise. Opportunities for digital transformation have also been identified in the Australian blueprint for trade and investment with Indonesia as having alignment with not only the country's human capital development objectives and the goals of IHEPA, but also with Australia's new international education strategy. My next guest is Clarice Campbell, Lead Advisor for Skills at Catalyst. Clarice leads a portfolio that delivers high-performance labor market skills for Indonesian businesses and government, particularly in sectors heavily affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Hi, Clarice. Thanks for being on the Catalyst podcast. Hey, Sondang. Thanks for having me. Clarice, President Jokowi is urging for socially inclusive digital transformation that leaves no one behind. Leveraging digital technologies for social inclusion is something that the IHEPA is designed to support. Could you explain more on the kind of partnership enabled by the IHEPA? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, And you're very right that obviously the Indonesian government does have a bit of a focus on creating more inclusive opportunities um, across the economy. Um, So some of the partnerships that we're envisaging will be enabled by the IACEPA um, are commercial partnerships that do have a sort of gender and social inclusion element to them. Um, And I think for me being responsible for our skills partnerships, that's a really important element that we want to push as much as possible. there have been times when, you know, we think a little bit too much on the business side and the sort of transactional side and think, okay, how can X company uh, connect with a Y company and, you know, what's the sort of commercial and financial uh, value to that? Um, but when thinking about skills, you know, we need to start thinking about, well, how can we be a bit more uh, inclusive of different minority groups, of uh, people with diverse gender backgrounds, Um, and who come from areas that are sort of outside of, you know, a lot of the focuses, so the Jakartas and Surabayas and Denpasars of the world. (laughs) Um, So when we're looking at, um, you know, what are the opportunities out there, I think underneath IACEPA, we will be having a bit more of a focus on sort of JEDSI um, aspects of commercial opportunities that do arise. Um, so that, that's something that we definitely want to push um, when, we're, when we're seeking uh, these business partnerships. If we look at the Australian blueprint for trade and investment with Indonesia, uh, there are opportunities that have been identified for Australian training providers to meet Indonesia's growing needs in the digital economy sector. Could you walk us through those opportunities at various levels, national, sectoral, subnational? That's another really great question um, because skills is, you know, something that a lot of people, they, they sort of know is necessary and particularly when it comes to sort of digital skills, but then what are the actual opportunities available? And so within our program, um, we're sort of thinking about uh, how can the expertise that various institutions have in Australia when it comes to the digital economy be matched with uh, Indonesia's uh, businesses who are thinking about expanding in this space. Obviously, Indonesia's digital economy is exponentially larger than (laughs) Australia's at the moment, but there are a lot of skills that and technologies that various businesses in Australia have that just aren't present here in Indonesia. So, you know, how can we actually sort of match them? 
So when we're, uh, you know, speaking to businesses and speaking to providers, we're thinking, um, you know, what are the various ways that we can match them? And it could be at the sort of city to city level, you know, maybe there are um, sort of alignments in things like smart city technology and skills relating to that. Um, but it could be also at the sort of provincial and national level as well. So thinking about, okay, well, is there a network of businesses that could work together? Is there a network of institutions that could work together um, that span across Australia and Indonesia? Um, digital economy is something that I think is going to continue to be a focus of the program and for Australia and Indonesia moving forward. So um, this is not going to go away. <laughs> and I think that, you know, there's just so much that Australia and Indonesia could sort of look to work with each other on. Um, there are various technologies that the vocational education and uh, tertiary level education institutions are uh, utilising in the Australian education system at the moment that, you know, can be applied to um, professional development here in Indonesia. So um, that's kind of what we're sort of thinking about at the moment. For us, we have some focus areas. Um, digital kind of goes across everything, but we're especially interested in sort of health and tourism opportunities as well. So how can we, you know, make um, smarter decisions when it comes to healthcare and are there digital skills in the healthcare system that we can match from Australia's um, experience with Indonesia and as well, you know, with tourism. Tourism is a huge part of Indonesia's economy and a huge part of Australia's economy. Are there digital solutions and digital skills that we can implement from uh, Australia's experience uh, with Indonesia? So that's kind of where we see opportunities sort of lying between uh, the two countries. And I think that's backed by the blueprint that was released by the Australian government. One thing that's certain is that there's a lot of changes happening across industries right now. If you look at manufacturing, for example, Companies are having to reconfigure their supply chains and production lines. If you look at the service industry, they're having to emphasize a digital first uh, customer journey and contactless operations. There are more examples that we can think of. Why is now a good time for companies to invest in upskilling and retraining? I think now is a good time because companies will always need skilled workers. <laughs> um, I think sometimes, you know, you sort of engage with the business and the expectation is, you know, when they're sort of hiring, um, you know, people into their company, that those people uh, already know how to do the job. And we know that that is actually not the case. You know, you're always, when you join a new company, you're always going to be learning, okay, how do I actually... Uh, adapt to the culture of the workplace. Uh, there are particular skills that, you know, you might need to sharpen. And so you actually do need to have professional development opportunities in your own company um, rather than sort of relying on, okay, yes, I went to this institution and I learned this and this is my background and I have all of this other work experience. But you're always going to need those skills, um, you know, when you're moving into a sort of new uh, business and sort of learning about a new job. So I think um, companies, particularly in Indonesia, are coming to sort of realize that, you know, there is a bit of a push for human resource development and sort of how that can be implemented and done well in the country, um, considering that, you know, a lot of uh, companies are hesitant to even hire, you know, fresh graduates from various institutions because, you know, they, they're they dissatisfied sometimes with the uh, education that these um, young, young people in particular are receiving. So there's an opportunity there for those companies to realise that, okay, well, if you have all of these young people or new people joining the company, there's a reskilling and upskilling uh, component to bringing these people on and providing them with opportunities to learn more about how their business operates and the skills that they need to work successfully in that particular company. Um, so I think it's really important that companies are investing in upskilling and reskilling of their staff members because, you know, they can't simply rely only on uh, education institutions, particularly if they, they're dissatisfied with the, the level of education that's, that's coming out um, and sort of what the graduates are learning. Um, so I think now's the time to invest in this. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for these companies to be connecting with uh, companies and uh, education providers from Australia who might be able to fill that gap 
um, that they're they're sort of missing in Indonesia. Um, and this is going to be an ongoing conversation, I think, for quite a long time, just considering that the skills gap uh, evident in Indonesia is so large. You know, we've heard a lot of figures that 50, 60 million people will need to be upskilled by 2030. And, you know, the figures are always changing all the time. Um, but taking that into consideration, well, you know, why delay? Why delay um, having a professional development opportunity within your company? Um, so I think that is sort of going to be the theme that that companies will focus on for the next little while. Very well said. Thank you, Clarice, for being on the Catalyst podcast. Thank you, Sondang. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the pace of digital transformation that now sustains our lives and supports business growth. What we have learned from our guests today is that embracing a new digital mindset will help companies innovate, transform, and shape their future success. And that's the end of this episode of The Catalyst Podcast. Hope this has given you a lot to think about. We invite you to join in the conversation on social media and on our website at ayachepa-catalyst.org. See you in our next episode.